Most locomotives make noise. This one made trouble. When Union Pacific tested it in California, people reacted instantly. The noise cut through entire neighborhoods, and it didn't take long before communities decided they didn't want this machine anywhere near them. It didn't sound like a train at all. It sounded like a jet engine that refused to quiet down. The heat pouring out of the exhaust could soften asphalt on a warm day, and anything flying overhead was simply unlucky. Even the crews who ran it said you didn't just hear the turbine. You felt it in your chest long before it came into view. This was the locomotive too loud, too hot, and too overwhelming for the places people lived. And somehow, Union Pacific still put it to work every single day. In 1962, the city of Los Angeles delivered an unprecedented message to Union Pacific Railroad. Your locomotives were no longer welcome, not because they derailed, not because they were unsafe, but because the noise was so unbearable that communities simply would not tolerate it anymore. These were Union Pacific's gas turbine electric locomotives, machines that produced a deafening jet engine roar. The noise was so intense that they were effectively banned from operating in major California cities, including Los Angeles. Crews complained constantly. When Union Pacific later relocated the horns to prevent ice buildup, the change came with an ironic benefit. The crew finally got relief from the relentless sound, but the noise was only the beginning. The exhaust could melt pavement. The heat cooked birds in mid-flight. And the sheer power, 8,500 horsepower, carried hidden costs no one fully anticipated. That figure came from the turbine in the B unit. The whole three unit set functioned as one locomotive in service. After World War II, Union Pacific faced a dilemma. Their legendary big boy steam locomotives were nearing the end of their service lives, but the diesels of the era simply couldn't match their power. A typical diesel, like the EMDF-3, produced about 1,500 horsepower. A big boy produced around 7,000. To replace one big boy, you needed four or five diesels working together. That was expensive and complicated. Union Pacific wanted something better, something more powerful, something radical. General Electric had spent the war years advancing gas turbines for military aircraft, so General Electric proposed adapting that jet engine technology for the railroad. The advantages looked irresistible. Enormous power, compact machinery, and the ability to burn Bunker C fuel, a thick low-value byproduct oil that refineries were practically giving away. In 1948, General Electric delivered the prototype. Unit 50 produced 4,500 horsepower from a single engine, triple the output of the average diesel. Union Pacific was impressed enough to order production units. Between 1952 and 1961, 55 gas turbine locomotives entered service across three generations. The final series, 30 units numbered 1 through 30, were among the most powerful locomotives in the United States at the time. They were also about to become the loudest. Union Pacific called them Big Blows. The nickname was earned. Union Pacific said these locomotives produced a deafening jet engine exhaust noise. Inside the combustion chamber, fuel burned at 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Exhaust blasted from the roof at 150 miles per hour, with temperatures reaching 850 degrees Fahrenheit. It was not just loud, it was a continuous jet roar you could hear miles before the locomotive arrived. When Union Pacific tested the turbines between Salt Lake City and Los Angeles, communities reacted immediately. The tremendous noise made the locomotives deeply unpopular. After only a few trial runs in 1962, Los Angeles became effectively off-limits. Union Pacific restricted turbine operations around major cities. Crews suffered too. Engineers and firemen filed so many noise complaints that Union Pacific had to take action. In the mid-1960s, the railroad relocated the horns to prevent ice buildup in winter. The move had an unexpected side effect. The new location finally reduced the noise inside the cab. These locomotives could not operate where people actually lived. They were too loud for cities, too loud for suburbs, too loud for anywhere except the most remote stretches of railroad. For the crews, running a turbine wasn't just another assignment. It was unlike anything else in American railroading. Starting one felt closer to preparing an aircraft than a locomotive. Engineers would idle the small diesel, bring electrical systems online, and then light the turbine. 
When the jet engine ignited, the sound was immediate and overwhelming. The roar built steadily, rising into a relentless jet engine blast that never faded. Inside the cab, normal conversation was almost impossible. Even after the horns were moved, many engineers relied on hand signals or waited for throttle changes to speak. Veterans later described the experience as relentless. The roar never stopped, even after hours of operation. But the power was unforgettable. A single turbine could pull a train that usually required multiple diesels. Engineers described the feeling as unstoppable, right up until something went wrong. A flameout in a tunnel, a sudden loss of power, or a fuel flow issue could turn that confidence into fear. It was a machine that demanded respect. No one who ran one ever forgot it. And the noise was matched by extreme heat. The turbines earned another nickname, bird cookers. The column of superheated exhaust rising from these locomotives was so intense that birds flying overhead were literally consumed in mid-flight. It was not folklore. It was documented reality. Infrastructure suffered too. Near Ogden, Utah, yard crews developed special procedures for starting turbines under the Riverdale Road overpass. When the turbine fired up, exhaust at 850 degrees blasted upward at 150 miles per hour. The asphalt pavement above softened, melted, and sometimes ignited. Crews had to time starts carefully to avoid fire. Tunnels were worse. The turbines consumed oxygen so rapidly that in confined spaces they would flame out. Trains were left stranded while superheated exhaust filled the bore. It was dangerous, unpredictable, and expensive. The fuel itself was a nightmare. Bunker C had the consistency of molasses at room temperature. Before use, it had to be heated to 200 degrees, using massive heaters built into the 24,000-gallon tenders. The fuel was corrosive and full of ash and sulfur. That caused soot buildup, blade erosion, and constant overhauls. For several years, Union Pacific made it work. The turbines dominated the long, open eastern district between Council Bluffs and Ogden, territory where noise complaints were minimal. At their peak, these 55 locomotives hauled more than 10% of Union Pacific's total freight tonnage. But the economics were fragile. The turbines used roughly twice as much fuel as equally powerful diesel locomotives. This worked only because Bunker C was cheap waste oil. But by the mid-1960s, the plastics industry discovered uses for heavy petroleum byproducts. Refiners learned how to crack Bunker C into more valuable fuels. Prices skyrocketed. Union Pacific's fuel advantage evaporated almost overnight. High maintenance costs, noise restrictions, and tunnel problems all collided at once. The turbines became unsustainable. The first retirements began in 1968. On December 26, 1969, the last turbine made its final run from Cheyenne to North Platte. By February 1970, all remaining units were officially retired. Some had operated barely a decade. That was shockingly short for machines this expensive. Union Pacific preserved nothing. Twenty were returned to General Electric and stripped for parts. Ten were sold to Continental Leasing and dismantled. The rest went straight to scrap. Only two survived. UP-18 is at the Illinois Railway Museum. UP-26 is at the Utah State Railroad Museum in Ogden. Both are static displays, stripped of major components. Out of 55 of the most powerful locomotives ever built in America, only two incomplete shells remain. The Union Pacific gas turbines represented the peak of American locomotive ambition. They were among the biggest and most powerful freight locomotives ever built. They could haul trains single-handedly that normally required multiple diesels, and they dominated the remote plains where noise did not matter. But they were too loud for cities, too hot for infrastructure, too expensive once fuel economics changed, and too specialized for a railroad that needed flexibility. In the end, these machines were defeated by their own excess. The jet engines that gave them incredible power also made them impossible to live with. The big blows proved that, in railroading, there is such a thing as too much power and too much noise.